In Blitz, 90% of games are decided by tactics. And today I'd love to share with you 8 easy to use rules for you to find combinations and to calculate variations like a Grandmaster. Let's go! It is the first position, it is wide to play and checkmate in 4 moves. If you will, you may pause the video for a little bit and try to figure it out on your own and after that we're gonna discuss it together. So, what's the problem with this position? Now, it's very easy to go down the rabbit hole of calculating this check because it looks like almost a checkmate, but not yet because black can cover. Now, after that, you see, okay, what can I do then? Maybe I can do this check or this check, but in both cases, there is no clear outcome. Because if you go here, the king can just escape and the situation seems to be complex. If you go here, the king also can go forward and you can try calculating this, but it looks like very complex position and there is no easy solution because we wanted to deliver a checkmate in four moves, okay? Now let's go back and here comes the first rule of calculation. You gotta determine candidate moves first. Before going down the rabbit hole of calculating a single one of them, determine all the meaningful options that you have in the position. Now in this case, we want to attack this exposed king and we're down the rook so we definitely need to do something drastic right now. Besides queen g-zone, is there any other move that would make sense here? Well, there is also knight to f5 check, right? And besides these two, I mean, I don't really see any other move because also our queen is attacked or rook is attacked. Therefore, definitely white needs to play a forced move. So we've got queen g7 or knight to f5. And if you check these both options, you can see that if you go knight f5, actually, it's much easier to calculate this line because black has not that many options. Our rook cuts the king off. Therefore, the king can go there. If it goes here, then now queen g7 would be a checkmate. Therefore, he can't go there. Let's take it back. What else can he do to parry this check? Well, he's gonna take. And now we wanna keep attacking. Now, here's the second rule, which I think is gonna be really helpful. And I think that classical chess books never share it. Now, here's the rule. In most cases, you gotta calculate lines for three moves ahead. Just three. In the vast majority of the cases in chess, it is enough to figure out the outcome. Because usually, like people often ask me, like how do grandmasters visualize positions for many moves ahead? You don't need to visualize them for many moves ahead. Just three, two, three moves in most cases is enough. But if you have it as a goal for yourself, okay, I'll try to calculate three moves forward and see what's going on there. This is a much more doable task, right? So let's try to keep calculating. So we'll play queen g7 check to the king. It's gotta go forward. Is there any other check? Is there any other force in move? Because we do want to finalize the line, right? We want to calculate till the end, till the outcome. And we see that in this case, we've got one more check, which is queen to d7, which forces the king to go all the way forward. And now it can already, like, you, you can already feel that probably there's something good here that's going to happen for white. And actually, there is. There are actually even two checkmates, f4 or queen d6. And both of these moves would be a solution, and this is checkmate in four. Here's the second position, it is black to play, white's last move was queen a4, delivering check to a king. How would you play here as black? Please think about this. Now I'll tell you the rule that's gonna put you ahead of 80% of your competitors right away. Because in this position, around 80% of players play wrong and lose the game right away. Now, here's the rule. You gotta play force and moves, which are checks, captures and attacking moves. Why do you wanna play them? Because that makes your life easier. That forces a very specific response of your opponent, so you don't have to think about anything that he or she can do, but you only have to worry about like a very specific thing. So, in this position, for example, most players play c6, statistically, which just drops this knight on e5. And it's a blunder, white grabs the knight, white attacks all around, you know, puts pressure all around, and white is completely winning here. So that's what most players do here. However, and some players play queen d7, which is actually the same thing. Similarly, blunders knight takes e5. This knight after d7 blunders knight takes e5 as well, because the knight is pinned. So black has a huge variety of ways to lose this position. And um, even if this knight drops back, it doesn't lose this knight any more. However, it is wide to move and white can keep pushing, keep attacking. They can go e5. Now this knight is in danger and has no good square to go to and black is still kind of in trouble. Black usually loses here as well. Let's say they trade. Now they realize that the knight still has to go. They move it somewhere, h5 or g8, doesn't matter. And then after e6, it turns out that white is still winning because of this pin. So that's what happens to most players. And what I suggest instead is for you to play force and moves and to consider force and moves first of all. Those moves which force your opponent to do something. In this case, that would be bishop d7 attacking the queen and forcing the queen to go. Now, here's the beauty of this move. Even if you miss the fact that your knight was hanging, you still would not blunder it. 
because you force your opponent to do something. Your opponent can't do whatever he wants. He's got to address this threat. And after they move the queen somewhere, now you'll start thinking and maybe you'll figure out that, hey, this knight is actually attacked and maybe I want to take there myself and your position is great after that. So the rule is consider forcing moves first and foremost. It is white to move again, white to play and win. You may try to find the solution on your own and then we'll discuss it together. So here's the next rule and it's kind of a continuation of the rules we discussed previously. Candidate moves and forcing moves. In order to find a combination, you gotta pay attention to force and moves because that's the essence of all the combinations. Which means that you gotta pay attention to all force and moves, including those which look absurd at first. For example, here you gotta check rook h6, bishop g8, you know, queen takes g7, queen to g6, all kinds of checks and captures, right? You all you consider you have to consider them all. That's one of the rules. However, it certainly feels overwhelming, because if you look at all these arrows and think, oh my god, I gotta calculate all that, you know, I'll run out of time. So what do you do about that? Well, the second rule suggests that you gotta calculate all these moves, but you start from those that make sense. Because we're not computers indeed, we're not stockfish, we're not gonna calculate all these variations and hundreds of them. No, we're gonna narrow it down by using the logic as well. So we kind of mix it together. For example, let's talk about rook takes h6. Like for a second or two, you gotta be thinking about this move. But here it's pretty easy to see that as black recaptures, not only you lost a rook, but now black is attacking. So that would be a completely terrible thing for white to do. And you can quickly exclude, exclude this move. The same goes for bishop g8. Although you may think about this for a second, but basically I don't see the reason to calculate this move that much because you just give up the bishop and nothing really changed besides that. So, like, I don't see the point, right? You don't take anything, you don't really make any unfavorable change of position, just lose a bishop. Now, how about queen takes g7 and queen to g6? Well, those two make some sense, and you may have a look at that. In this case, if we take here, then it's a pretty simple calculation. We just trade off everything, and now our attack is over, and we down, we're down material. And that's not what we want, right? So we take it back. So finally, we've got queen to g6. The only forced move that is left to calculate, and you will consider this move. By the way, what if this move doesn't make sense? What if it doesn't work? Well, then you will just conclude that force and moves don't work and you need to play just a attacking move, all right? So maybe you'll play rook to g3 to triple and to double down on this file and attack, something like this. But first you consider a force and move and you consider it. Okay, so this check is gonna take. Now, we want to pay attention to force and moves, right? So first off, we wanna deliver a check to the king. And here we realize that it can go there because of our bishop. So king h8 is forced. Do you have any other checks here? Because remember, we gotta calculate three moves ahead and for as long as we have checks. So rook takes h6 is another check, and it's actually a checkmate, and that's the solution. Also, let me mention one very important thing. Just notice how practical that is. That's exactly how I think while playing chess games. Because the problem for many players is that they solve tactical puzzles, and it feels nice, they can find the solution. However, they do know that there is a combination there, and they look for ways to sack something. But when you actually play chess, you do not look for a way to, you know, give up your queen. And therefore that tactical training, solving puzzles, becomes kind of irrelevant because you don't think like that while you actually play chess. While what we're discussing right now is a lot more practical, is a lot more down to earth. I'm telling you, you gotta calculate only two or three moves ahead, which is doable, okay? So you don't have to like overcomplicate matters and think that if you can't calculate for many moves ahead, then just you can't be a strong player. You don't need to. Like calculating one, two, three moves ahead is enough for the vast majority of chess positions, all right? And number two is, we're looking for checks and captures. However, if they don't work for some reason, then we just play an attacking move. So if all these sacks do not work, then we just play rook to g3, for example, and we just attack the knight. And therefore, this way of thinking helps you to find combinations and it just helps you to find good moves when you're playing the actual game of chess, okay? So these little life hacks or chess hacks, so to say, can make a big difference. Uh, by the way, today we're talking about calculation, but if you wanna know my collection of all these little tips that make a big difference for a chess player regarding avoiding blunders, calculation, strategy, opening, effective training, etc. I've got a course called Level Up Your Chess where I put together all the methods that help my students the most. And I'm absolutely sure that you are gonna like it because, you know, it's just the best of the best in one place. And I'll drop a link down below so you can check it out if you will. And let's continue. It is white to play and win and you may try to solve it on your own. Now let's apply what we know already, so we gotta look for force and moves, check captures attacking moves, and determine our candidate moves. Now when it comes to check, we can play queen takes g7. However, it doesn't seem like it brings much, because if we do so, black recaptures and 
yeah, we're just down material. And we, we talked about this previously that although we consider all force and moves, but we also want to apply logic, right? So we gave up our strongest attack in peace and we are kind of running out of material to deliver a checkmate. So that's not good. Are there any other checks? Rook takes h7. Okay, another one. And here we see that if we take there, I mean, he can't actually recapture with the rook because of this pin. Therefore, if we take there, he'll gotta recapture with a king. And so that's one of the lines that's worth calculating. All right, in terms of captures, what can we do? Uh, we can take maybe rook takes g7. Okay, it's one move to consider, but then he recaptures. Nothing too special happens. And we can also pick up this bishop. So maybe if there is nothing better, we're gonna just pick up the bishop. But we still need to consider rook takes h7. So we're kind of having these couple options for us to consider, but we start off from the most forcing move, and the most forcing move is a check because it's just easier for us to consider that. For example, just for comparison, if instead, let's say I start going down this path, I take here and now I take the bishop somehow with a king or with a queen, then now it is black to play and he can do something, right? So it's harder for us to calculate that. That's why I want to simplify our task and start from the most forced move, which is check. Rook takes, king takes. Okay, do you have any other checks here? Well, yes, you do. But here's the catch. A lot of players in this position suggest the move rook to h2, thinking that this is a checkmate. And uh, the rule says that you gotta calculate for both sides. It's very natural for us to have wishful thinking, where you pay attention to your ideas and you want them to work out, so you kind of push them in your imagination and you hope for them to work. But you gotta be careful, you gotta look at your opponent. And as you consider checks captures for you, you gotta consider the same for your opponent. And in this case, rook h2 would be a fatal blunder because of this queen, just grabbing the rook and black wins. However, white was so close to winning. It's just that instead of rook h2, white should have played another check. What it is? Queen h6 is a support he can take, but queen h4 rarely wins the game. I mean, black can delay for one move, but after that, that's checkmate. So the rule is calculate for both sides. And just like you calculate for you, checks captures taking moves, try to find same moves, same replies from the side of your opponent. This time it is black to play and win. Very practical position, by the way, very real. Therefore, you can definitely test your skills. Now, let's apply what we know. We know that we are going to be looking at force and moves. Checks, captures, attack and moves. And which one will you start from? The most force and move, right? Which is a check. Because, for instance, if you decide to calculate a capture, rook takes c2. And you start calculating like, okay, he takes, I go here and checkmate. Oh, oh, yeah, that's great. And I'm going to go there. But then if we go back, as you play rook takes e2, expecting your opponent to recapture, here comes the boom, queen h7, very annoying checkmate in one move because that was that bishop on b1, right? So that's why to prevent those kind of blunders, we say that you do want to start from the most forced move, which is a check. Because if you play check, there's nothing else that your opponent can do besides moving his king, okay? Now, if we want to check the king, what can we do? We've got bishop to h2 and queen to h2. And we talked about the fact that you also want to apply logic. You want to calculate the move which seemed to make sense for you. Because after bishop h2, this is a check to the king, but as the king goes, I don't really see the point of this check, and I don't see how it helped black to attack, really. So let's take it back. I would definitely consider queen to h2 first. King goes here, now we consider this check. Knight goes here, and then you calculate, okay, what can I do now? Maybe I'll take here, he takes, you calculate down this path, check, and now the king goes somewhere. And, uh, like, although you grab the knight, which is probably nice, However, you didn't win the game. And actually, at the beginning, white was up a piece, so the material balance is more or less equal now. Here's a tip here. Let's take it back. It felt like you were kind of close to checkmating white, right? A couple of moves ago, it felt. But now it doesn't feel so, because the king went away to this empty space, so to say, right? So there's a lot of space around the king. And it's quite hard to imagine that you can checkmate the king there. It's much better to keep the king in the cage where it's kind of locked there, can get out, and then you only need to deliver one check. So this one thing, in calculations, try not to let the king escape. Escape to an empty space where it can run away easily. Try to keep it there where you can keep attacking it. That's one rule. And the second rule is sometimes if you feel like the checkmate was kind of close, the king was really vulnerable, exposed, and you attacked it, but the checkmate didn't work out, try to just reorder the moves. So we consider rook takes e1, followed by queen to g1. What if we play them in the other order? And you can probably see that after queen takes, king takes, we keep the king caged there, and now after rook takes e1, that is actually a checkmate because our bishop takes away this square. 
And here's a little puzzle for you, just why to play and when, please think about it, and if you can't find the solution, write it down in the comments below. Also, if you missed my video on how I went from 1600 to 2260 chess rating in one year, check it out right here, I think it's gonna be helpful.